Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming here for this uh, session. Uh, I think we do want to get started. So just a very quick reminder to uh, switch off all electronic devices uh, so that we don't have interruptions during this time. Well, it's a delight to be here uh, moderating. Uh, I'm not normally known to moderate, but uh, moderating between two of the luminaries in education today. On my left, we have Rachel Glenister. Uh, who is the executive director at JPAL, which all of you know as the premier institution uh, working on evaluation around the world uh, with some fantastic work on education. And then there's Stefan Durkin, who is a university professor at Oxford, uh, economics professor at Oxford, chief economist at DFID, and uh, uh, so uh, we'll stick to that. And uh, just to, so, so the way this is gonna work, I just want to, put up you know, four or five slides on what we think about as the problematic in education uh, in Pakistan and then just, uh, and Rachel will go after that talking about what we have learned uh, about education from around the world. And after that, Stefan, and we want to leave sufficient space for uh, discussion and questions at the end of it. Uh, so just to be very clear about where we are coming from and what you know, might be a useful framing device uh, is, so Pakistan has many children who are currently out of school uh, and low learning outcomes. Uh, all the data show that primary enrollment increased from 2000 to 2010, uh, but it appears to have stagnated since with test scores that are not improving. And this is despite significant increases in budget, a large number of reforms, strong political and donor commitment, and a lot of research on education, right? So these are, for example, enrollment numbers that went up from 2004 to 2010, and then are roughly stable. Uh, these are budget numbers. So Nadia Naviwala had a very nice article in Dawn pointing out how the budgets in education have increased. Uh, they have more than doubled uh, in, in overall terms. In per student terms, they've gone up by at least 50%. And there's a long list of reforms that have been undertaken since 2000, virtually crossing out every bucket we usually think about in education. Uh, which leaves us with this, that look, there, there seem to be no easy answers. Uh, one possibility is that the reforms are not being implemented, but that also seems to be not the case. We typically find these reforms are being implemented in some form or the other. And what I want to leave uh, Rachel, pass it over to Rachel and Stefan with, is why hasn't this combination worked? Rachel. Okay, easy question. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, especially, uh, as I should say, I have done research in Pakistan, but not on education. So um, hopefully someone can pull up my slides. Um, so I, you know, come here with a hopefully a bit of humility in terms of what I can answer about what is happening in Pakistan, because, you know, there are many experts in the room and I'm absolutely not one of them. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, oh yeah, the click. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try and talk a bit about what, what we've learned in other contexts about learning, uh, improving learning. Uh, I was interested that there's still uh, some concerns about access and I have a whole other talk about um, improving access to education, but particularly focusing on the, on the question of learning. And then I'm gonna also talk a bit about what we found from a review of literature on uh, education technology because just in the last couple of days, I've been hearing a lot about the big investments that are being made in education technology in Pakistan. So, you know, as we know, there's been, you know, the, there's been a, a shift in attention from, from focusing mainly on access to uh, quality of, of schooling from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which I think is appropriate. I think there's still a lot of, um, you know, there, uh, as you say, there are concerns about access, and I can I can come back and talk about that later in the discussion. But I'm mainly going to focus on on quality, and in particular learning. So, around the world, we're seeing these very low levels of learning, despite improvements in access. Um, I, I was looking at the Pakistan numbers from the uh, ASA tests. Um, and so this is grade five uh, ASA data uh, showing that, you know, 50% uh, of uh, K-12 
kids in grade five can do uh, two-digit division. Uh, you know, very uh, sort of half the kids can do, can read a sentence in grade five. So despite being in school for many years. Interestingly, if you look at India, um, the, you know, Pakistan actually starts to look quite good. <laughs> uh, uh, because... Uh, you just mentioned the cricket now. <laughs> um, uh, in in India and not in many places, but but and this has come out from a number of different sources of data. You actually see declining learning levels in India year after year, which is uh, which is quite stunning. Um, and this isn't an enrollment issue. Most kids were in school at the beginning of this data in India, and and uh, most kids are in school at the end. And this is actually a test that's done on kids whether they're in school or out of school, um, and you see you know, declines over time. So there's kind of really this, this, this question that you posed, um, traditionally, is, is something that people are facing around the world. I think another descriptive statistic that is quite um, important uh, in terms of thinking about the challenge of learning is the wide dispersion of learning in a classroom in many places around the world. So this is data from um, the MindSpark study, and it just shows the level of learning uh, in different grades. So it, the grade that a kid is in, and then the, the, the level of learning that they're meant to be in. So sort of the, the dots show the range, and then you also see the level. So in grade six, the average kid is about a, a grade three level, but within that class, they're ranging from grade six to you know, grade one levels of learning in that classroom. And that dispersion you know, is, is true both in math um, and you know, this data is from India, so in Hindi as well. And so if you're thinking about the challenge that a teacher is facing, they're facing these very low levels of learning, but they're also trying to teach to a class that has people at sixth grade and first grade in the same class. And I think that's a huge, uh, a huge challenge that, that, that we're facing. Now, you know, I'm going to draw on a review of evidence about what has been working in education. Uh, there's been a huge increase in the number of studies of rigorous evaluations on this. Uh, just you know, JPAL alone has 190 RCTs on education in 39 countries. Um, but I'm also going to look at cost effectiveness of different approaches. Uh, so just a kind of background slide about what the data I'm going to show you uh, comes from. We're measuring improvements in learning in standard deviations, which is not a great way of showing <laughs> improvements in learning. There are all sorts of problems with it. Uh, but it's kind of the one thing that we can use to compare improvements in many different studies. So, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of the people here are economists, so you know what a standard deviation is, but just to give you, you know, other people a sense, point two of a standard deviation means moving a child from the 50th percentile to 58th percentile in a classroom. And obviously that's going to be different in different classrooms and there are all sorts of problems, but it's a one way of standardizing the improvements in learning across you know, many different studies. And in education, point two standard deviation is seen as kind of quite a good improvement in learning. And then I'm going to say for $100 spent, how much of, how many standard deviations of improvement uh, did we get? And to give a benchmark, you know, one standard deviation per um, hundred dollars is like incredibly good value for money. Um, if you think often, you know, this isn't universal, but often kids will learn a improve a standard deviation. Um, yeah, a maximum of, of, of a standard deviation in a year of, at a good school. So that's kind of a benchmark, and $100 to get a year's worth of learning is a pretty good uh, deal. And to compare it uh, to kind of the US standards, 0 0.05 standard deviations is what Tennessee Star, which is seen as a sort of a successful program in the US, got in a, um, in, for $100. So uh, the things that are proving effective in developing countries are just orders of magnitude bigger than you know, what you're getting for, for, learn, for spending in, in the US. When I present these results in a, to a US audience, they think I've got the you know, decimal point wrong. 
So, so the first thing is just to say, you know, there are an awful lot of zeros here, <laughs> right? So this is what, this is a, so each one of these bars is a different randomized impact evaluation and we're looking at, and, and you know, this we classified as just giving more of the same. So business is usual input. So just giving more textbooks, just giving more, um, uh, even grants to schools. Um, now I know, you know, there's some work in Pakistan where giving grants to private schools have improved test scores, but people have tried that in other places and found no improvement in test scores of just giving flexible money. So more teachers, more textbooks, more computers, all of these things without changing how you teach had no impact. So the the one of the you know one of these is school grants where that shows positive had had a positive impact was giving school grants and then the next year it's zero so even that is you know in the second year it's a zero so then i want you to focus on the only other positive in this chart which is textbooks for the top uh, of the distribution at the beginning so in general textbooks in, in, increasing the number of textbooks had no impact but it did have an impact on the kids who are already performing well. And I think that starts to tell you something about what's going wrong in education, in that the textbook could only potentially be read by and learnt from by the kids who are already performing well. Which, you know, brings the second thing, which is changes, if we look at what's common across the programs that worked, a lot of them changed the way that we, that, that teachers taught. So, uh, you know, one is tra tracking by achievement, so that's very cost effective because you're not actually doing anything other than just moving kids around. You're doing exactly the same thing, but you're tracking by levels of achievement. Um, remedial education, extra contract teaching and streaming, individually paced computer assisted learning. We start to see a pattern in that a lot of the things that are proving cost effective are changing the way that teachers teach so that it's more uh, directed at the level of learning of the child. So you can do that with computers, you can do that by having extra uh, tutors provide you know, remedial education, you can do that uh, with computer assisted learning that adjusts to the level of the child. Uh, but a lot of the commonality of what's working is, is about changing the pedagogy so it's more appropriate to the level of the child. In, you know, in coming, this is the one access slide I have, which is a lot of people, you, you sometimes hear people saying, we've done a lot to improve access to education, but it hasn't made any difference. Well, that's not actually true. Where people have tested providing schools in communities that previously didn't have schools, you actually do see increased learning there. So it's kind of a minimum <laughs> that you need. Obviously, people aren't learning as much but providing schools in the rural areas of Pakistan where there aren't uh, yet schools, I think, you know, has been tested in other places and we see improvements in learning. There are, so we don't, there have been more studies on this than we have cost data for, but I think something that surprised me, having done one of these studies on school-based management that didn't work, was that, was the finding that if you can improve the governance of a school, it can actually be quite a cost-effective way to improve learning. But I'd say that you know, there are as many zeros in this set of studies as there are successes. And we don't yet know, I think, very much about how to make, how to improve the governance of schools by including communities in the governance. If you can make it work, it's very cost-effective. But trying to find the similarities about what works and what doesn't is actually quite hard in those. So it's something that's quite hard to do. The other set of studies where you see a lot of positive results is teacher accountability. So clearly teacher accountability matters. Again, I think there's a lot of devil in the detail about how you design those uh, contracts to improve accountability. So I want to dig just a little bit into uh, the teaching at the right level uh, point that I talked about uh, earlier, and that is it's really, we found it to work in some very different contexts. So this is individual tutoring for kids in the south side of Chicago, and this is Pratam in India working with, uh, with kids in remedial education. Very, very different contexts. Actually, 
the one in Chicago was inspired by the one in India and, and was also similarly evaluated uh, rigorously and found to be uh, effective. So this is one plug that I have for Pakistan, which is to think about taking this idea of teaching at the right level, remedial education, and trying to mainstream it into schools. Because the, you, have, you, know, you have got partners here who are working on this concept. And India shows an example of how you can take that concept of providing more individualized learning, providing uh, particularly to kids who are falling behind the curricula, and, and scaling it up to a large level. So this was uh, introduced by an NGO, but then was mainstreamed into schools. Uh, and now over a million kids are getting that remedial education within the public school system in India. A few, a few minutes on, um, on education technology, and there's, you know, I could talk for half an hour about education technology, but this is, you know, here's some, just some counterintuitive results, right? To make you think about whether technology is always the right way to go. People have done RCTs showing that you, you actually learn more when you take notes by hand than if you take notes on a computer. There's been a lot of studies that have just introduced computers to schools. Pretty much across the board, you don't see improvements in learning. That's as true in California as it is uh, in Peru and other places. So it's, it's, if you simply think providing the technology is the answer, it's, it's very unlikely to be. Here's another counterintuitive result, which is this was a company who does computer-assisted learning, and they wanted to experiment with different ways of teaching on their platform, and they tried you know, gamifying learning fractions and a kind of very standard pizza slice approach to teaching kids how to learn fractions. They found more engagement with the gamification and more learning with the much more standard view. So, you know, gamification doesn't always lead to learning. So again, sort of cautionary tale. The thing that comes across again and again in the, in the, uh, in these reviews is what studies of computer-assisted learning worked effectively, ones that were designed to adapt to the level of the child. So this is, you know, whole, the, again, these are all randomized studies, and a very high proportion of them are getting very substantial improvements in learning when you use technology to, to respond to the level of the child. And if you are investing in technology, technology is actually a very good way of adjusting because a teacher faced with 60 kids in the class ranging from you know, grade one to grade six in learning levels will find it very, very hard to teach in that context. If they are in front of a computer, the computer can adjust uh, you know, if you have the right software, can see which, what, what kids uh, are getting right, what they're getting wrong, and feed them individualized lessons based on how well they're performing and what they're getting wrong. So I think that if you're doing education technology, this is the most um, encouraging, you know, route to pursue. Another one is, uh, so I haven't covered the access st uh, stories, but one of the you know, one of the things that proves most cost effective in improving access is providing information about education. And, and there's some experimentation on using technology as a way to provide uh, information, again, potentially tailored um, uh, to, uh, and it's being, ex a lot of experiments in Latin America on this. We don't have all the results, but, but there was a big one in the Dominican Republic that was done at scale across the, the, basically the whole island and has proved to be very effective, not only improving access, but actually also in improving test scores. So I think that's another thing that technology can provide. So in sum, it's not about the technology, it's about the problem and designing your technology to solve the problem uh, that's being faced. Uh, so a few resources to, you know, if you want additional information. Thank you. So I think we'll hear from Stefan now and then open up.
an extreme here for me because I can't even claim that I've ever worked on Pakistan as a researcher. <clears throat> and I apologize for that. Okay, and it will change. And um, <clears throat> very important. But <clears throat> so I've worked um, on and off on education. But actually, what I want to talk about is a little bit of the work uh, we ended up doing uh, setting up a research program within DFIT or funded by DFIT, uh, which I think some people here in the room actually are essentially or effectively funded by, at least for some of their work, um, that actually wants to try to see whether we can bridge some of these gaps between the way Rachel talks about some of these interventions and how we actually think to actually make these things impact at scale in a policy environment. Okay, So, you know, the, there's nothing different, of course, in the underlying analysis. Um, I mean, another way of putting off what these learning crises is in education is to, is to for example, look at these, um, these PISA scores, you know, the kind of uh, comparable data sets that get collected in various countries. And, of course, we know that developing countries have big gaps in learning outcomes relative to OECD. But what makes it really a little bit scary is that the gaps are, and if we take the gaps into account, and as well of the rate of change that we've observed in recent times. Uh, so the gaps is something like um, developing countries are something like 100 points behind the OECD. Now, what does that mean? Well, change has been happening in developing countries on average about one point a year. So it, it would take 100 years at the current speed to actually catch up in learning outcomes. Now, that doesn't sound good. That is not something... Uh, that very quickly now. There's other things we could worry about, some of these data and the way we think about it, but the gaps are very, very substantial. And this is probably why quite a lot of people got really concerned and like in the, in the process of the Sustainable Development Goals and actually realizing, look, these access doesn't learn, lead to learning necessarily and we needed to kind of also uh, get some kind of change in focus. There's a something there as well where Pakistan is maybe a, already slightly different from some other places in the world because in most places of the world, the children that are not learning are in school. Uh, Pakistan, I think, is about equal. The, the back of the envelope would say that the equal number of children that are not learning are outside school uh, and inside school. So it's a bit... Uh, um, somewhere where similar groups. But that means there's both something going wrong still, clearly, with elements of getting kids into school, but there's definitely something going wrong in school as well, where, depending on how you look at the data, about half the children, as you're also showing as well, is half the children are not learning. Um, now, it's one thing that actually say, well, you know, let's go to research and find these... Um, this intervention that really kind of makes a difference. And Rachel has uh, referred to uh, this very interesting paper in science that we actually do comparisons between a whole series of different types of interventions that we can do. And so, you know, whatever I say next is not trying to say this is wrong to do or whatever. But, you know, these are all based on very high quality evidence, RCTs, all kinds of various settings. Um, in one way of looking at it is that they all try to look at, you know, the marginal impact of some kind of interventions, often tested, not always, sometimes they are on very big scale uh, of service, but often relatively small scale. Uh, we're getting some sense of the returns or the, indeed the cost effectiveness of very specific interventions at the margin. Okay, what we... Um, and what we get is what, what, uh, what, what was shown is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't quite work. There's a lot of stuff that may seem to be working. Um, you know, we could have a long argument whether putting it on the scale of $100, what you assume about technologies and, and, and cost functions and so on. But, you know, it gets an interesting thing even looking at it as a lot of difference and lots of different settings. Um, for example... You may, you may be able to argue if you just look at the marginal impacts as the study itself shown and not try to extrapolate it on a, on a similar thing. Even if you were to add them up, uh, the most successful intervention in these different buckets, it doesn't seem that they easily add up to the full gap. Doesn't mean if we then scale it further, if we spent a big sum of money, we may get somewhere. But but most of the studies, if we take the 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 the, the, the marginal impact that's face value from the study itself, adding them all up together, it's not going to get us entirely even to this gap. And you no, know, we could argue about it. But the point I want to actually make uh, more importantly is to to actually get the evidence of what is that marginal impact, what are these marginal return or that cost effectiveness, doesn't easily answer whether we can 
replicate. Now, I don't want to make a simple point here of external validity. It is a, it is a form of external validity, but it's also, you know, and this is when you work in the policy environment. It's not just the case that if I have from five years ago evidence that in the Punjab something works, that it means it will work exactly in the same way. Lots of things are changing all the time. So you, you have to kind of, this is not just about other geographies, other countries, but it's even over time that, you know, environments change. And you have to ask yourself, you know, will it be? Now, I'm not trying to say therefore or conclude this must mean these things don't work anymore. But it's not so straightforward to say that in policy you can with certainty just take something of five, six different countries, including from your own, just start applying it, and then be certainty, no, this is going to work in this particular way. A, a, a related thing is that it's actually something different from external validity, but it's actually about scale. And then, of course, cost functions, the shape of scalability, we don't often have very good information on that. You know, something that works at small scale, would it have the same, you know, it may, you may have the organizational capability to do it at a small scale. Do you have the organization capability to actually do it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times at the, of the scale of that intervention? Of course, it's again something we don't know necessarily. And it's two points I want to highlight here, definitely for someone who works inside um, a government department in the UK, is to actually simply ask the question, you know, do we or whoever would be the partner or provider of that, uh, that, uh, that uh, intervention have the organization cap capabilities to put it to, 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 uh, at scale? You know, it's one of these things that talking these days for some other reason too often to people who work, say, in Silicon Valley and, and working venture capitalists and so on, is that they actually say it's the idea itself, not that we put money in, we put money in the team. You know, I'm not trying to say it's necessarily the same, and, or you know, don't, definitely don't want to say that they have evidence for this, but they seem, to be, they seem to have a trick there, and if it's indeed true that the causal link is for them also the team, we need to ask that question. Can this team that actually works at small scale, can you actually do that in the kind of team, the government system, the NGO system, can you actually do that ever at scale? And a related point, of course, is then the political economy, the political support. Is it politically sustainable to do these things? And this is one of these things that definitely I learned to work in policy and trying to apply some of these things. If you don't think of the political economy of doing these interventions, you basically shouldn't start trying to do policy. You know, you cannot ever, in no circumstance, create this kind of ideal uh, technocratic, uh, technocratic focus. Everything becomes political. You know, look, I'm here in Punjab. Education policy is political now. Targets have been set. It becomes political, and it, it needs to be done. Anyway. Where does this lead me? It's not trying to say that this kind of work we would do as researchers with the RCT, we shouldn't really do it. No, no, we better do it. Because at least what it can tell you, that potentially these things could work at a very small scale, or at a scale that you tested it. Now, it's quite helpful, because there's plenty of things we try at scale, that actually, even at the smallest possible scale, uh, didn't even work. Now, again, God knows there may be certain functional forms where it could not work at small scale, but it could work at large scale. But let's not go there. I doubt it that, uh, that that's the way um, uh, to go. So definitely, if we learn anything from medical things, is that fine. If it doesn't work in a trial, it probably won't work at the population level. OK, so unless. Well, there's maybe some reasons you can give. Economists or uh, academics can give you reasons. But let's not go there. So what we want to do, and this is a program that we're supporting in, 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 in DFIT, and we've put in quite a substantial sum of money. I think it's like 24 million pounds to start with uh, across lots of different countries, and including here in, in Pakistan, is to actually asking the question, well, maybe we should start making sure there is research that takes, takes another lens, and that starts from the system as a whole and actually then try to deconstruct it. So it doesn't mean that some of these deconstruction will, they will mean some of these small building blocks that Rachel is talking about, but actually asking yourself, can it actually be pieced together and what would it look like if you take the lens on a systems approach? Now, people work on health have found that extremely simple and a simple idea. You know, health systems research is a common way of doing research. Now, health systems research sometimes is an excuse for not doing very good research, but there's a lot of health systems research that is actually quite good. And I'm sure there's education systems research that will emerge that actually is probably not very good research. But, um, but again, can we find ways of doing this carefully, cautiously, and as consistent with all the evidence? And so basically, this is a program called uh, the RISE program. And the question that it's asking, I forgot now what it actually stands for. Do you know what this does it stand for? Research in 
systems of education. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was simple, and I couldn't quite, uh, I couldn't remember the I, which was uh, funny, but it is in systems of education. <laughs> I'm improving C, it isn't, it's not even right. <laughs> Research and improving systems of education. I'm very sorry. Oh, absolutely right. Look, if this is the only factual inaccuracy that I say, I'm quite happy. <laughs> uh, good. Um, so anyway, and it tries to look at what works to improve education systems to deliver, um, uh, you know, tries to study and try to identify what kind of works and taking these different lenses. So it is asking, besides actually some of these building blocks, you know, how does the system work as a whole? And how is actually, and that's a, that's a question that not easily gets answered uh, or, or rarely gets answered, but how is change happening? Now, it could have lots of different research designs, including RCTs, to actually try these out. How does change happening? Um, what can change, not just what should change, or what is technically possible to change, but actually what can change in the system that we're working in, and understand why it doesn't. Um, and on basically questions such as why reforms fail, why they succeed, okay? Now, I can assure you this is not simply cricket. You know, these are simple, this is more complicated than the rules of cricket here um, in it. And, it's, and I think it's quite important. So it's basically ensure that you do think about, you know, those things that you can really rigorously test or can learn from other places, how they fit into it, but you ask the questions about, you know, uh, the replicability, you keep on monitoring very carefully of this replicability at scale or in this particular time, and indeed uh, at, uh, uh, and, and, and this, uh, the replicability and the scalability as well. But it does lead you to ask questions often more about delivery than what the thing is that you should do. It may ask questions, although I know textbooks sometimes come out well and sometimes don't come out, but say in textbooks it's not just about does the textbook improve or not, but how actually get textbooks uh, in, into the schools and how do they get used or whatever, and it is about the delivery education as well and the politics. I do think this is not simply writing a nice little consultancy paper on top of, of rigorous research. And I have the impression that some people just think, oh, it's easy and we'll do that in five minutes or, in a, or uh, quickly. I think it actually matters also, uh, by just doing this, it matters for the practice of policy as well. Making this part of, the, of what is happening on the, uh, on the policy and political front makes, makes a difference. And I want to actually make a point, and I'll, I'll, I'll be subtle, but I presume you will understand. You know, you could actually think that just reforming education is just about finding a couple of bits and pieces and then set up a command and control structure to get it delivered, where the order comes from the top, where you monitor the data extremely carefully, and then subsequently you keep on checking that very carefully and just keep on ordering that it needs to be fixed. Now, if you think education more like a system, you will start also by thinking more carefully about the agency of all these parties involved in it. And education is not something you can get delivered by command and control structures. You need your teachers to be really committed to teach. You need, to, uh, you need the systems to work. You need the relationship between the various parties. You may need to think about what the unions are doing. You can't simply order them about because you know, they have agency. Whether you think that is the right thing or not in their actions, that's a different matter. You need to understand how they operate. You need to understand how bureaucracies operate and what their incentives are and the way they will mediate any kind of reforms you do. You need to think about how politicians think and you need to make that part of the, the way of the research. So we're doing this, funding this in six countries, um, quite ambitious, so as I said, Pakistan is one of them. We're doing it in Ethiopia, in India, uh, in Indonesia, um, in Vietnam, and Jishnu, what is the sixth country? Ethiopia. I said that. Tanzania. Tanzania, thank you. <laughs> Someone knows at least. Uh, I couldn't read my handwriting. Um, but, but, no, yeah, excellent. Uh, but, but look, this is, this is simply a, a, a way of doing it. We have quite high hopes that this is, this is not in itself, each single piece that will come out of it is not in itself worth chattering, uh, but uh, kind of, um, but it is a way of actually making sure that this link with how things are done within a government system or indeed in a parallel system, in a private system and so on, that you keep an eye open to what doing it and that you don't reduce trying to change and get reform as simply just a matter of adding up a few technical interventions and then think it will be easy afterwards. Okay, thank you. Quality RCT studies 
And one of the things that I picked up from your talk, Rachel, was uh, you know, business as usual inputs are definitely not working. Uh, and some of the most consistent evidence that's arriving is teachers have a hard time teaching to children who are at very different points in the pedagogical or learning uh, framework and interventions that are allowing more tailored lessons uh, to different kind of children, whether you deliver it through computers or technology or people, uh, all seem to be having a substantial impact. Uh, Stefan talked about, well, the problem may not be the particular pipe that you fix, but whether we need to think about a broader set of institutions and political economy uh, that at least sets up the delivery pipeline in a way uh, through which you can start thinking about what should be delivered uh, uh, at the end of it. And there you start to get into pretty deep issues of political economy and politics. Uh, Stefan then also introduced us to the substantial funding in uh, that's trying to get the systems research going. Uh, this funding is almost as high as 2% of what you guys are spending on education in Pakistan, right? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, it's, I think, uh, look, uh, as DFID, if I may just that, is that we make a point that 3% of our spending uh, is actually on research in general. So mm -hmm. we're actually a little yeah, bit yeah, low yeah, here yeah, exactly. in terms yeah, of... Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, exactly. uh, so I'd just like to open up the floor. Uh, we'll stick to the definition of a question, a sentence with a question mark at the end. Uh, uh, and uh, let's take, you, what would you guys prefer, one by one or would you? Uh, so I'm happy to take two or three questions and then see whether a common theme arrives and uh, uh, pick up on that. Yep. Hi, my name is Asad. Um, so it's in, in some sense, this, this sort of call for systems research involves a move away from sort of the, the insistence on very, very good causal identification that, that academics insist on. Um, would the incentive structure of academics in this, in, the, in this instance sort of change enough to compromise on that a little bit um, and keep external validity, sort of give it, give it a little more weight? Um, so in some sense, it has changed because there is now money to do it. But will there now be different incentives in terms of publications? Um, do you guys envision compromising on that? Um, do we have more external validity? Would academics be into this? Uh, thanks. Um, in If you can just quickly give us a name, that'd I'm be Kate great. Borny yeah. from Duke and Cirque here. Um, as you mentioned, Rachel, there's been a huge amount of investment in technology here, and just generally, I feel that there's a. Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Um, I, w I was interested in, in your perspective about to what extent we know w is the technology uh, a substitute or a complement for teacher ability? Because uh, often I encounter people talking about these sort of technological in <coughs> interventions in education as though they can be a substitute for teachers' lack of knowledge and so forth. Given the, what you mentioned about teaching at the right level, how much can this kind of fly on its own? No matter how much you train a teacher, if he or she is not committed, no one can do anything. So what kind of technical interventions can help uh, perhaps screen good teachers, committed teachers? Or if somehow not a very committed teacher is selected, then converting that not a very committed teacher or using, it, uh, using him or her for, for teaching kids, how can we uh, do that? Well, if this single thing is done, then I guess we are successful in transforming education. Nothing else is required. Hello. Um, I'm Adil Khalid, um, and I think um, you guys touched upon certain issues that are very pertinent to uh, what education scene is right now in Pakistan. So I'm interested in when we talk about access, so what is the role of language and literacy and um, in terms of English as a medium of instruction? So 
Um, you guys haven't talked about this issue, so I'm interested in knowing what are you, what is your perspective on this. Thank you very much. These two important questions about uh, do you need good teachers to deliver, to use technology, uh, which then comes up with also uh, Sahim's question here, uh, which I think goes both between the RCT and the, and, and, and the kind of systems approach, which is how do we screen and hire good teachers, or is that an intrinsically political task? Uh, so that's perhaps one question to start with, and then we can move to the others. This, sorry, uh, about this relationship between thinking about the systems research and the and individual randomized trials. Um, I see them as very complementary, and I think one of the things that and you know and the political challenges of Im implementing any of the results of these studies. Uh, I feel like the the results that we're getting when you look across a review of studies like this, you start to see, I think, some systems questions arise, right? Why is it that, um, I mean, if I, I talked about the diversification of learning levels in the classroom, but there's also, if you remember back to that slide, the curriculum is up here and the average student is down there. And that starts to raise questions about why is it that you get a, a curricular average you know, mismatch. Why is it that teachers are teaching to the top of the class? Is it about the incentives in the system? So I think a lot of uh, the way I see the results of randomized trials is not just to say this one thing works, but to give us information about what, what, is, what are the kinds of gaps in the systems. Uh, and I think a very clear set of systems questions come out of this research about uh, you know, curricula being designed for, uh, you know, people see education as entirely about you know, getting a formal job and that's, that, that's what education is about and uh, you know, the curricula is therefore focused on that and is focused on, and the incentives of the teachers are all based around getting kids to, to you know, getting the top kids to perform. Um, and, you know, I think we get, a, and you know, you see that from that very first textbook uh, case that the textbooks were designed for the top of the class. So I think the right way to do this kind of research is to look at the in-depth, um, rigorous research and look at what a kind of, what that's telling you about what's wrong with the system. Uh, and, you know, and I think it, it, the education example is very clear in that, that it, it is kicking out a number of problems with the system about incentives for teachers. And then once you've got that, you can start thinking about designing systems changes and then can potentially test those again. So I think that's kind of the feedback um, system that, that, that you want to do. Um, there was, uh, you know, and again, you know, Stefan raised things about doing things at scale. Uh, uh, you raised a question about the incentives. I'm not, you know, for whether you can get something published that isn't, you know, very well identified. I'm not a journal editor, so <laughs> that's not up to me. Um, I would say that increasingly people are asking, um, you know, if you test something which is infeasible to do at scale, like clearly is, you know, a lot of money, so much money that, you know, it's not going to be possible to do, or is reliant on very highly skilled inputs, it, people don't find that very interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not a criteria in the journals, but, but most people are, in, but, you know, if I'm reviewing something, I'm like, I, it's just an uninteresting question whether something that is going to work that costs a million dollars per village or, you know, requires incredibly well-trained teachers. Uh, like, I don't find that an interesting question. A lot of other academics don't find it an interesting question because we're just not going to find those resources. So I think what, what, it, what academics are actually most interested in testing is something that doesn't require good teachers. I mean, I, I, I often quote um, my colleagues at Pratham who, you know, I started doing education research with. They're like, 
a lot of educationalists wished that teachers were, you know, the, we had really good teachers and they were really well trained. Well, we're not going to, Pratham's not going to wait for that day to arrive. We want solutions that work with poor quality teachers, you know, who aren't showing up very often. Like that, that that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for a solution that works with middling teachers uh, who aren't necessarily well, well trained. And I think that then, you know, can speak to whether it can get scaled. Um, on terms of the complementarity of technology and teachers, I, I don't, uh, you know, this, the specific question of does it substitute for good teachers or not, I think, um, you know, I don't think people have answered that incredibly precisely. Um, you know, the, the work that I've seen hasn't sort of, you know, done a heterogeneity analysis of kind of what was the quality of the teacher. I think what is... What I think is an exciting area where you could potentially substitute, use it as substitution, is where you're getting into secondary education, where we know that uh, in cases where the teachers don't know the material they're meant to be teaching, right? And so one of the very first RCTs was use technology, RCTs on education, use technology to fill that gap. It was a study in Nicaragua in the 1970s and it used radio education to, to provide math education where the teachers in the schools weren't very good at math, right? And so you went to a technology, you, you could kind of brought in the expert. And that was actually very successful. I think, um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities there to substitute for the thing, you know, once you get into more sophisticated learning and the teachers don't know the material, there is an opportunity to use technology. I don't think we really explored very well how to do that um, or tested many of those approaches, but it is at least a potential. I have a point to that. Wait, can, yeah. we, can we hold on for a Just second? I do want to give Stefan just two seconds. I do want to give Stefan a chance to respond. Yes, to I would like to respond. But Rachel. if it's with the previous uh, point, then I'll come straight. Okay, okay. sure. Um, I I have a student in school. Um, yeah. In the second year of IB, he decided that um, he didn't want to learn from the teachers because he saw some documentary on YouTube where they said teachers are obsolete and technology is everything. So when this happened. Um, I, well, I had a few discussions with him. I teach visual arts. Yeah. So he um, decided not to come to school for the year. Uh, he decided to drop out uh, because he thought YouTube would be the best option or going online. But he didn't know what he was doing. So when you want to use technology, I wondered, I asked him, do you yeah. know what you're looking for? Do you know what you want to study? Or do you know where anything is going? You have technology. You have a lot of information out there. But uh, you know which resource to stick to and what not to. Yep. So I don't think technology can completely replace a human being. No. And um, no, no, there is so, no option. So this because he kind of, he's one of the kids who flunked. Yeah. So, the, so, so. I, think the, I think the question, I wasn't at all suggesting that it would replace. And indeed, you know, people have done studies comparing online education and, and um, lectures and you learn less in the online version. Um, I think it's, the question was, is it, it, can you use it, do better teachers use it better or can it, com can it but substitute for some? But then you need somebody who can teach the yeah. student to use it. Yeah. So Stefan, your, uh, Asad's question of whether you're bribing people to abandon causal identification. <laughs> yes, no, no, it's, it's, oops. So, you know, I mean, hmm. There is um, there's an interesting thing. So I'm kind of weighing myself what I really think about this here. There's, there's on the one side, you know, I'm a researcher, and of course you want your freedom to, to research. But, you know, as, as someone who had to write, sign off the check of uh, UK taxpayers' money of 30 million, I don't think I should be ashamed that we were trying to set incentives towards certain things that were really troubling us in the way we're operating. And it's a very simple thing. A huge amount of research gets done on what should be done and very little about how you should do it. Now, it's up to the creativity of researchers 
to actually take it and publish or uh, and uh, or indeed perish um, the, if, if, if they if they if, if that's the kind of choice because but at the same time because we do know there is a small but really interesting literature and in fact you're referring to it as well in the review on things to do with accountabilities and so on who starts getting at some of these kind of issues so so it is just you know setting some incentives to actually let's 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 push a little bit more from an from an identification in terms of uh, sorry, that's not the wrong word. From a from from yeah, from a problem identification uh, at least to to uh, to actually making sure that 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 we bring this closer in a, in a way that we don't do silly mistakes where we treat these things as technocratic things that can then easily and uh, it's it's over. Am I incentivizing a little bit? You know, some towards towards the responsibility of researchers. I mean, we could have a big argument about it, but um, the. I do think that it's actually not a bad thing. But what was racial is implying, although it doesn't happen enough, is that actually people look at all the things that there is there and that they've done together. And actually, you know, working in policy, the worst thing I see is actually people having very bad judgment inside policy environments on what the evidence tells you. And I really find it very frustrating that um, that, that especially economists, but typically researchers, are, I think, what Lyndon B. Johnson called, you know, um, they, they never are the kind of economist you really like, which is one-armed economist. Because otherwise, you get on the one hand and on the other hand kind of stuff. And you want to actually be willing, you want to actually get bright, smart people to be willing to make judgment, to actually put together what actually is there and actually say, my best judgment on the basis of all these bits, including a few things that are not best educated, uh, sorry, identified uh, around education, to actually get the best judgment. And I, I wish, you know, one thing we probably try to incentivize here is that people, by looking at the whole, to actually make a statement, how does that little bit fit into the whole and being, being, being helping us. Look, we won't necessarily agree, especially when it gets a little bit Greer, even if I read across studies, I don't have necessarily an, a perfect methodology of how do I read across. But that's judgment, and I think academics should be daring, should be willing to have judgment so that others don't make terrible judgment uh, on, 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 on bits and pieces of research that we present to them. Faisal. Um, so I'm not sure if I've thought through the question myself as well, so it's just more reflective. But I mean, so. What if the answer to the system's question it doesn't lie within the education system? So a lot of the RISE work is within education systems, right? And I mean, when I think about the issue of uh, reform in Pakistan, I've been working for almost two decades now here, a lot of the answers have to do with managing human agency. And that goes across not just education, health, but a number of other areas as well. Right? And so, I mean, and here I'll stop because I still fully don't know the implication of what I'm saying, but what does that mean for the kind of work we should be doing? Yeah, um, I'm Ravel, and I just, I, 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 mine, mine also is not particularly well formed, but um, for systems research, what would you, like, you um, mentioned gaps in research, gaps in system, systems research, and we're, we're not, when you're looking at systems, you're looking at the relationships between different systems and what, how that contributes to learning and education. So would you recommend, like, what would you suggest is a better way to capture that? Would that be process evaluations or impact valuations, like what would be a good way to look at what is, what is success? Is that, an, I mean, and if you use that process evaluation data, would you look at it as something iterative or something which is, and I, I mean, that's something which I, I commonly struggle with. What, what, what could be uh, measured as success? Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Zia. I'm working with the World Bank. Uh, and my question is actually very related to what Ravel just said. Um, so I was thinking more about how we're approaching education in general. So in these RCTs that we see and all the research about systems, 
the way we're measuring different interventions and, and how we're measuring the effectiveness of these of different systems is, is we're focusing on, on like a bunch of indicators, like learning outcome test scores. And I was just wondering whether, um, you know, just focusing on these particular indicators is a good thing. Uh, do we need to kind of uh, uh, go beyond and start thinking more about figuring out better uh, things to measure? You know, that kind of like goes back to the question of how we're really looking at education. And so I was just, uh, I just wanted to hear your, uh, your okay, thoughts so on that. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's interesting because just the fact that the questions are being asked is, 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 is helpful to some extent. No, I, first of all, I want to say, you know, the word holistic, you'll never get out of my mouth. I just said it, but I just, it, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say that you have to make it wishy-washy and, and all and bigger and bigger and the whole world and look. As academics, as researchers, we know that answering questions, the, 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 method, the scientific method is basically breaking it down in bits and pieces. The only thing I'm saying is that actually you keep on breaking it down and you have a different, you know, let me allow me to be a bit like uh, Karl Popper now in, in science philosophy. You do a searchlight approach to research. You search in a particular way. You look at it. Um, and that still remains the scientific method. You know, it's not, a, and it's, it actually talks in a way to the identification question earlier. You do that as carefully as possible, answering bits and pieces. All I'm asking is that actually when we come to the world of policy, these things need to be brought back together. And actually the only appeal is that, that, we, that we break it down by briefly stepping back. Where, how shall we break it down this time rather than the usual thing? What, I, what hasn't, you know, which little soft skill hasn't been tested yet uh, on the impact of productivity or something? And let's find something and we find it beautifully identified, run an RCT. No, no. Step back and ask the question, you know, where is it that actually I could have most value added if I understood this bit in it? Research it carefully, do it. And then I appeal to it, which is the harder one, help to build it back up together, you know. Um, and, and that is the, all I'm appealing to. So this is not about, you know, like your question that you say, look, all these things are interrelated. You know, that, that makes the, both research exciting because everything is interconnected, but also very hard because we need to break it down in smaller things. But if, and this is now just a hypothesis, that in country X, the entire mess in education and I'm, I'm really not making a statement on anything here, I don't know, but I, I'm actually thinking of another country. If the entire mess of education, probably the biggest factor is, is union behavior, then that is important. And there's no amount of textbooks that you actually then uh, need to keep on testing or small inputs that you need to do. You need to actually start thinking about carefully you know, uh, how either you can circumvent it or how can you deal with it. And, and that's, I think, important to, 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 to keep, keep, on, keep on asking yourself. So, um, yeah, and it's, um, no, I think I leave it there. And do we, yeah, your point on, do we ask the wrong indicators? I don't know. I mean, it's, if it happens to be, if the way you start looking at it again and say, well, maybe these ways we're doing these learning outcomes doesn't capture a certain dimension. No, that's, that's a valid direction of research. I don't know. And, let me also say, and go to the website of different RISE projects, everybody's interpreting this very differently. But they're all trying to actually ask the question, how does it fit together? And that's actually, I think, most exciting part, is asking the question how it fits together and give a reasonable answer to this as a beginning, rather than simply saying, oh, well, now suddenly uh, uh, getting it back together. You know, think of the history of systems research. It's actually in the Anglo-Saxon world, people don't do it. If you go to a German university, everybody's doing systems research. Mm -hmm. Because it actually comes from an element of engineering. It comes from, from actually from rocket science uh, approaches, NASA approaches that we need to get all the things together. And it's, uh, it's not because Rachel is sitting here, but you know, uh, little O-rings matter. You know, things matter in the whole picture. And actually finding the bits and pieces in it, it's quite important. We can keep on researching, improving a little bit of that engine. If we don't uh, focus at some point on that O-ring, it's not going to work together. No. Rachel said before, I just want to reiterate that, uh, which is, you know, experimental, the way Rachel presented the slide, it was experimental ways uh, uh, and the improvement they show, right? But what Rachel said later is really important, which is experiments can be used to identify problems, yeah. right? Uh, and then we can think about what are the political economy or politics of why those problems exist. 
Yeah. Now, one thing I'd like Rachel to think about for these for these answers is, well, once you identify those problems and you start thinking about the politics, in a lot of cases it turns out this is a complex adjudication of multiple demands on the state, right? Uh, at which point, how do we want to think about you know, and both in RISE and otherwise, is researchers work describing that problem, right, and saying, well, you know, teaching to, it's really important to get that top 10% because our returns to labor are convex and maybe that's the most efficient thing to do, right, uh, because then, you know, they're intra-sibling transfers, maybe that's the best and most efficient thing to do. Or, uh, you know, do we want to think about research as solving a problem, right? I mean, and and uh, it'd be interesting to get your views on that. Yeah. Well, I actually think on that last thing of, uh, uh, you know, we don't know yet whether education is, whether the returns to education are, are you know, we should be focusing on the top. I, I mean, I'd argue there's quite a lot of evidence, um, a lot of it not incredibly well causally identified that, while people while a lot of communities think that education is just about getting that formal job there's a lot of returns to education which are for the bottom end you know people who are more educated are more likely to use fertilizer they're more likely to get their kids immunized so i feel like one of the mismatches potentially that there is in the system is people are focused on education being about the top and actually there's a lot of benefits uh to uh, to improving basic education, uh, you know, basic literacy and numeracy, and that's not... Uh, then you get into the political economy issues of why is it that uh, that the education system isn't focusing on, on, um, on basic uh, literacy and numeracy. But I think, you know, one attitude of people, um, you know, if... if if Lant Brickshard was here, he'd say, well, you know, there's no point in, uh, improve, you know, figuring out that you can improve basic literacy and numeracy with these, you know, cheap interventions that I've been talking about because, you know, it's all the political system. I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic in saying that if you can provide policymakers with relatively cheap solutions to basic literacy and numeracy, Let's at least try that and see if they won't respond uh, because there is, you know, there are potential returns. Okay, it may be hard to move the whole education system from worrying about the top 10%. They're probably still going to be focused more on the top 10%. But <clears throat> I'm not so pessimistic that if in, in going to policymakers and saying, look, there is this way that you can improve uh, the rate at which you get uh, kids doing basic literacy and numeracy, and it's not going to cost you very much, our experience has been that they can be quite receptive. Not everyone, you know, not everyone cares about that, but there are enough policymakers out there who will be responsive that it's worth working with them. Um, and yes, when you're doing that work with them, you've got to be very conscious of the political constraints and the political economy in which you're working. You don't walk in and say, well, the obvious solution is just to, you know, ban all unions or, you know, do something that's going to be absolutely at the heart of the unions. I think part of what I enjoy in the policy work that I do are based on, you know, finding these findings, and then going to governments and talking about how to do high-level reforms based on the results is the intellectual challenge of thinking through how do you get those reforms given the political constraints that you face. Uh, you know, so maybe contract teachers is very politically difficult, but maybe, maybe you know, remedial education done by volunteers is actually as if you sell it the right way as as complementing as, you know, relieving the burden on the teacher to, to get on with dealing with, you know, other kids because you've got someone else who's helping with the kids who are falling behind. You can't, there, there are ways to sell this within the system that I think at least, you know, our experience has been as being quite, um, quite effective. So I think when you're thinking about how to translate these specific research results into a bigger uh, policy change, you've obviously got to think about the political economy, but I wouldn't say, 
if you're not, you know, therefore, you know, just assume that political economy means that because it hasn't been done, it's impossible to do. Ali, you had a question. Poses a really important challenge, which is that, you know, you, you find that there are interventions, they may not even work o over time. So in interventions which show returns. And, the and isn't it sort of time to really bring the sort of challenge of bringing smart organizations as an important part of us thinking through how we engage? So that's a question that I wanted to pose. There's another question which is, I completely take your point, and it is fascinating when you do policy work, that you're looking at the political economy constraints and proposing solutions, or indeed identifying problems subject to those constraints. But I always worry in some sense, because we are dealing with one agency, which is the state most of the times, that we actually stop thinking about how to remove political economy constraints. We, 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 we become too compromising. And again, that's part of our engagement. And how do we rethink that? So those are the two questions. Ismail Qureshi, uh, since somebody who has worked on the practice side for a while, uh, <clears throat> I was just wondering from your discussion that uh, researcher, as you see, has got to have something extra, which is saying some skill whereby there could be possible convergence between the policymaker, what he desires or she desires, and what you're suggesting. Now, from my, my experience, very little skill is available. There are few people around us here, I know them, they are doing very well. But, but that is an issue very much, that how do you get the buy-in? Uh, you have a reform. I was looking at the number of interventions you mentioned, whether those interventions were driven by the research alone, why is it still zero, so many of them, or they were politically driven? So how do you choose your interventions? I was just wondering, is it part of the political economy, or you're outside of that, and you make a choice, and then present it to them? I was just wondering, how, what's the best way and methodology by which we can look at this? Thanks so much for the panel. My question might be uh, a bit simple for the discussion, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of making teaching more aspirational as a career. And just wondering if in your experiences within Pakistan, but particularly outside, if there are any case studies um, where countries have been successful in doing this, and is there some learnings that we could perhaps grasp from that? I, mean, I think perhaps just give five minutes consideration to this. Well, Stefan, you've already been accused of bribing researchers to give up on causal identification. Yes. And now Stefan and Rachel, you're both being accused of uh, uh, working in ways to make organizations less smart. Um, so. Uh, I, I think this is an important issue, which is, you know, uh, both in the question of how are we choosing interventions, what's the political economy about that, uh, and what should the engagement with organizations be? Uh, is Does it require us actually stepping back, giving more over? Uh, I think these are key issues that have troubled all of us for a while, and be good to hear from uh, Rachel and then Stefan. I actually think one... Uh, uh, one of the benefits of doing the kind of research that, that I do is you really get, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're interacting with the, with the um, implementing partner. And in, when, these, when these collaborations work well, and they don't always work well, but when they work well, you're designing the intervention together. Um, you know, you're doing like a uh, you have kind of a diagnostic phase where you're helping them think through what are their challenges and bringing data to the, you know, they'll have concerns they already have, then you bring data to the issue and you also bring the experience from other places. And then you have a very productive dialogue about, you know, what could you potentially do? In my experience, those, that kind of productive joint generation of solutions 
only happens after you've been working together for a number of years. Um, because you, with that, you build up trust where people are able to open up new ideas. Um, but I, I, I hope, and you know, I have seen this in in some experiences. I'm going to mention Pratham again. You know, I think they've become a better learning organization from working with us for many years. I think they, you know, they all talk about how they think about issues differently. Um, you know, they've become much more data driven in what they do. Uh, not that they weren't before, but like over many years working with us, you can see uh, the development of, of some of that. Um, and so I hope, I, I hope that we, you know, when done right, that collaboration is, uh, is one in which they learn a lot too. They may not be able to go off and do RCTs on their own. That's not really the objective. The objective is for them to learn how to critically evaluate other people's evidence, critically question their own evidence. I mean, at the very, like in the very simplest level, one of the things that we find when we're designing an RCT is simply taking an organization through their theory of change so that we can measure every bit of it. Like even that process leads to a lot of discussion and, you know, they may not always have had a very clear theory of change and you kind of force them to go through that exercise, it can be quite an interesting experience. You know, having said that, that's when the partnership works well and it doesn't always work well. Um, uh, and then on the, I just want to come back on this, this point about teachers. I mean, I, you know, off the top of my head, I'd say career is, <laughs> and nobody really quite know. You can point to examples where teachers are highly valued. I think the question is, how do you change a society to be that? I don't think anyone knows that. Uh, so you can point to examples, but what was the way that they got there? And can you change it once you've already got a system where teachers aren't valued? That's a, uh, that's a really difficult question. Right, so, um, so, so, so the, there was a question there, how would you choose your questions and how, how, how do you do this um, in, in the in this respect, so you know, um, in my experience, and, and I think actually, uh, the National Growth Center is meant to follow that same early way to engage with the policymaker in terms of having good understanding what questions keeps them busy. Um, you know, you don't have to answer every single question because you know um, they don't know research, they don't know what can be researched and what is feasible, but you can build up a relationship and actually ident help to identify, you know, these are good questions that actually can be researched, I can actually give you an answer. Get that early buy-in means that you actually start working together with that research, whether it's RCT and intervention-based research, but also in other questions that you say, look, this is what's your question, we work on it, this is the things we're learning and so on. I think that works well because you, you take them along. That's a good thing. My experience actually leads also to something that I've been finding quite fascinating. And some of the impacts in certain countries, and I have an impression maybe even here as well, is that it actually helps also uh, to make you know, certain things that are quantifiable, that are researchable, kind of nice issues to actually, um, or that are evaluable to actually make them issues that you can actually organize your politics around, you know? Issue-based politics is something that we value a lot in democracy, you know? Issues that you then, that means by implication you come to things that you can either measure or evaluate one way or another that can actually be objectively assessed and so on. It actually helps the policy process as well and leading that to this kind of being smarter, I think there is, that actually is one way in, in fact, to, to help to, not just taking the political economy as given, but actually treat it as endogenous, because if you're very clever, you start picking these questions that are a little bit disruptive, a little bit different, that are distributionally not neutral, but favoring certain groups that are excluded and so on, and then you can start working smarter. I, I want to make a bigger point on that point, though, in terms of you know, how to deal with policymakers and so on. And just drawing on my own experience, as be, having been an academic and then suddenly uh, basically, as I always say, never had a job, never had to be accountable to anyone as an academic, suddenly actually become a civil servant. Um, now, I don't know in general if it's everywhere in the world, but as a civil servant in the UK, you are accountable. Um, and, um, and you are suddenly in a very different structure. But what, what was for me the most striking example is, is that 
I always thought I'm, you know, these policymakers, these these bureaucrats, they don't really want to listen to me, and I do all this research, and they don't want to take it seriously. A lot had to do with trust. The day I was inside, I could say anything, and they trusted me. It's actually a bit scary, actually. Anything I say, they, they think it's based on evidence, which, of course, everything is except for forgetting the RISE acronym. Um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, it's actually a scary thing, is that there is certainly a huge amount of trust inside, which you have to then use very carefully as well. But I think that actually gives an indication there is a trust relationship between researchers and academics and the policy environment because, you know, in political environments, people are a bit scared of you because you may well be out to get them. You may actually publish something that is actually undermining them. So you have to negotiate that relationship as well and be willing to be trusted and offer ways of trusting and say, look, um, I know in countries, not here, but in a particular country in Africa that I've worked a lot, the deal really is that we have massive access to the things to all kinds of information that before we write a paper, they have a week that they can see it before we present it anywhere. And I think it's really good because they can have a look at it, they can think about how they can handle it. They only ask for a week and that's enough. They can really think is this sensible, sensitive or not. But it gives them the sense that you know you did this for me, you did this with us, and now you can go out. So you look for ways of building that trust. And I think that's another way of smart ways of working to just abuse the word smart again. Um, to, 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 to actually doing it. And I, and I think looking for ways that work within a political economy is a crucial part. I think academics sometimes, they just love to, to or just say it, get it in a newspaper, give my moment of fame, and actually having impact uh, is considered if I got it in the newspaper and I could get some attention. If you really want impact, you want to look for the best way within the political economy to have the actual impact. And it may be sometimes meaning, be a bit quiet for a while but actually see whether you can have impact. Anyway. So I think we're going to take two last questions and then give the floor over for concluding remarks from uh, Stefan and Rachel. Uh, so one there. Um, yeah, I'm Anam. I'm a research associate at SAP. Um, my question is around whether there's sort of any evidence or research emerging on how the traditional classroom is no longer working and any new kinds of sort of models that may be that may be working very well. So I don't know if that's kids maybe, uh, you know, using technology, getting lessons customized to their skill level and then coming together. I don't know if it's other kinds of models, but if yes, any kind of new models of learning that there's a lot of evidence to suggest are very effective. Sure. Tahir, you had a question? Just a general question on, you know, is this idea of research and evidence as the most important way to convince politicians and for change. And it looks like, right, I mean, if you think about like the art of persuasion, and you know, so in, in these uh, US Senate hearings, right, I mean, you have all these people present all these numbers and data and all this, and then one person comes in and she says, I was disfigured or I had this incident, right? So, I mean, the question of whether evidence is salient, and you know, so if you're seriously talking about political negotiations, not saying, you know, how should academics do it? And it looks like, right, I mean, people lobby for all kinds of things, people, there are other ways of, of convincing people how to change their behavior. And I'm just wondering, you know, on, on, in general, on the role of evidence and this idea of when you talk about trust, I mean, part of our idea is coming around. So we are impartial, we have the scientific method, we have rules. And, you know, it looks like that stuff in, in general is not very efficient in terms of convincing people. They, they, I mean, I see poli politicians and policies change for all kinds of reasons, and this just seems to be a very long, difficult process of changing policy, and, and uh, actually seems to be going down, right? I mean, the level, value of research, value of facts in, 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 in many parts of the world, where I come from, is really going down, and, and people will do what they do. And I'm just wondering if you are serious about political change. Uh, I mean, research is one component of it. How do we really embed, I mean, is that something we think about? Okay. Uh, let's switch. Do you, do you want to take that? And yeah, I'll take, and you take the, uh, also the other one. <laughs> no, it, I, the is, it, I, I, I totally take your point. I mean, let's, you know, um, this is, but, but this, is, this is our USP, is that we want to be evidence-based, okay? So this is, this is what we should be. You know, I, I'm, I, I, I actually find it really dangerous 
uh, you know, in a world where we may want to have evidence-based policy making, that we get these things like, as we often see, this eminence-based policy making, which is basically someone with a big reputation can say anything about anything. You, you get a Nobel Prize for some small bit in some bit of science research, and suddenly you can start pontificating about population growth and the end of the world, and everybody thinks you're God. So that is, I find, very dangerous. So, so I think the real part, you know, you, you said it, we have rules, but we also have rules about honesty. We have rules about impartiality and careful using the evidence, and that should always be our USP. I think researchers who abuse that, you know, hopefully they get found out. We know they're not always found out, um, but it's, it's the kind of thing. You know, that's the minimal accountability we should have. What we also shouldn't do, and this is what I definitely not will appeal, I'll say working inside government and so on, we should never go to policy-based evidence making. You know, the policy is determined, please give me the piece of evidence that supports it. Even though if I'm really honest, I know it's recorded, that's the most common question I will get from politicians. This is what I want to do, is there any evidence for this? And you really have to fight it. You have to look differently, what does the evidence say? You find, uh, you know, take the kind of median set of results, the most common result on something, that seems to be the, the on balance what the evidence tells me. And then, of course, you can go and clever, be, become a clever communicator. A uh, former chief economist once told me, you know, an example is worth, in, in the World Bank it was, an example is worth far more than any, any work from the research department ever. Um, <laughs> the point is what researchers should be doing is honestly pick that example as being representative of the evidence. Use the same techniques, but don't start telling you, oh, I went, met these women, that changed their life, if it's not based on evidence. But if you actually know this is the kind of result, Dare to use an example because otherwise, you know, they don't get their heads around it. Politicians use examples. That's how they communicate. Journalists use examples. They don't use a number, but they use an example and so on. But, you know, let's have our own rules of the game. Be honest and have the humility uh, to actually be very careful in, in how we communicate about these things. Okay. So, Stefan, one value, valuable thing, you just taught me what people mean when they say we must make an example of the research department. It's a, <laughs> it's a positive thing, right? I, uh, <laughs> I'm not responsible for your chief economist. <laughs> um, so, uh, to give an example of how the, um, of, of, of one of these which is, uh, makes the classroom look very different. I mean, I've been talking about teaching at the right level, but if you actually see some of these remedial programs in practice, um, it, the class looks completely different. I mean, I was just in Zambia. Uh, we've been working with the Ministry of Education there for, for a while to you know, do this process of first diagnosing their problems and then thinking about what, what is relevant and uh, from the previous research, and then how would they try and implement it given their constraints? But I went to these classrooms uh, where they're doing these re the summer remedial programs, and you know, this this string uh, across the classroom in the zigzag form with letters, you know, little pieces of of paper with letters written on them, hung on or words hung on them, and then the kids have to go and rearrange the letters to be able to form a sentence. So this is, you know, the class that's doing, focusing on moving from words to sentences, you know, they're literally moving the sentences around on these. And that is not like any African classroom I've ever gone in. And another one, you know, they're, they're writing on chalk on the floor, you know, all the tables and chairs are removed. So it's actually, even just taking that classroom and dividing it by the level at which the children are, is kind of pretty revolutionary because that's not how, you know, it's normally it's the teacher at the front and they're all in lines and you get the same thing. So, uh, you know, you've seen a kind of ra rather dry presentation of this, but actually when you see it, it there's a lot more that goes into this uh, remedial education than, than just, you know, I phrase it teaching at the right level, but it's, um, it's really changing the way teachers teach in a very fundamental way. Um, and then just on this uh, presenting and how do you convince people, I've talked quite a bit about relationships, which, you know, the long-term building of trust. And I really think that that's very important uh, in terms of communicating and, and having the policy influence. But the, uh, one more trick that I would talk about, which is 
often when we present the results, we try not to have the academic just come and present. When I'm talking about presenting it to policymakers, we pair the academic with the implementer, with the person who actually did the program. Because if you're talking to policymakers, I mean, an example is you know, where they were changing the hiring practices and, and management practices with, not hiring, sorry, the human resources, but the management of police in Rajasthan like how you promoted and, and, and rewarded police in Rajasthan. When we get, went and talked about that in other states, they didn't want to hear from us. They wanted to hear from the person in Rajasthan who'd managed to change the way, you know, they're like, there's a 300, you know, uh, rule book on exactly how everything you had. How on earth did you manage to do that within the 300 page rule book? Uh, it wasn't us they wanted to hear from, they wanted to hear, and that's often a very powerful way of communicating your research. You know, you can give the, the, the results of the regression, but then the, have the implementer there who did this, who made change happen, um, and have them talk about it, and they're often extremely effective communicators of your research. Okay. So um, we are out of time, so I won't keep you here much longer. But just to kind of summarize, I mean, I think we had a very interesting discussion about, you know, what's the kind of role of research uh, and, and the integration of systems and political economy. I'm, I'm not sure we come to full consensus on this. I mean, there seems to be some broad kind of view that, look, using randomized trials as a way of understanding problems, uh, but then working very closely with institutions to, you know, do two things. And Stefan, you know, a little more uh, worry about the politics and the political economy and hitting the hard problems. And Rachel also raises this point that, look, it, it's not that you need to change the whole system. There's a set of things that you can do within existing systems uh, that, that may yield high dividends. Uh, you know, I remain broadly confused about two things. I mean, one is each of these requires enormous human capital, right? And working at the World Bank, uh, one of the things that we always worry about is, you know, there were two papers produced on Benin over 25 years, right? So, we, we, you know, we're short on human capital. What, how should this work, especially with external validity concerns or, or with systems research? Uh, and the second point, I mean, that Tahir brought up and which I, I remain seriously conflicted about is, you know, how much of research is descriptive and how much of it should it should be about change, right? Uh, should we be the people engaging in politics? Are there dangers, like uh, Ali was pointing out, in a certain kind of mode of engagement with politics that in a democratic society we want to worry about? I'll leave those thoughts with on, on, on the table. Uh, but I just wanted to thank especially the people, first of all, Rachel and Stefan for graciously making the time, uh, but also the group of people who put together this event, uh, which is a consortium of uh, different institutions. Uh, so there was SERP, there was IGC, uh, the LUM School of Education, CDPR, and uh, uh, ideas. And uh, if two institutions, if five institutions can put together an event like that, it does call for an enormous degree of trust. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you to, uh, to everybody uh, on, on, on being here and for making the time. Uh, and I hope uh, it was a useful discussion. So thanks so much.